afternoon. I'd, I'd like to, uh, to welcome everybody today to uh, what should be a very, very interesting discussion with Dr. Graham Allison, led by our friend and colleague, Chairman Mike Rogers, uh, the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress is, is really pleased to host this discussion today. We are uh, an organization that was founded 65 years ago to study presidential decision making and, and live in a, a current iteration where we focus very much on uh, the important national security questions of the day, looking at them from a very uh, nonpartisan perspective. Uh, we do that by having built a bipartisan team um, that includes myself and my uh, colleague, former Congressman Mike Rogers, um, who design our focus on a number of important issues. Many of them are currently framed under um, an examination of the new great powers competition. We know that um, Dr. Al uh, Allison, who joins us uh, from Harvard, uh, has a deep background in security affairs, uh, including having served as an assistant secretary of defense under the Clinton administration, but having served a long range of bipartisan mix of, of presidents throughout um, a number of years and brings a deep experience to us uh, and a knowledge of nuclear weapons, Russia, China, and presidential decision making. Uh, Dr. Allison will help us all today in the next hour no less than the question of how the U.S. and China relationship will define the 21st century. So we're very excited uh, to have him with us today. And without further ado, I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Chairman Mike Rogers, uh, for his welcome and to take us into our conversation. Mike. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Thanks for all you're doing for the center. I, and I'm really delighted to have the, the honor of, of uh, talking today with Graham Allison, who is a very distinguished uh, learned expert on the topic of China and really all things national security. And I have to tip my hat. He's the original dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, uh, has won the highest award you can win in the Department of Defense as a civilian, uh, the Distinguished Defense uh, Public Service uh, Award given, given by Bill Clinton for really important work, by the way. Some 12,000 warheads went away uh, and took it away from adversaries by the personal uh, effort of uh, Graham Allison. So I'm always honored to be in his company. I always think the world, uh, I, I'm always a little smarter when I walk away from, from Graham's company and I am always better for it. And I will say this, and I want to thank you for this, Graham. I know this is maybe not so politically correct, but somebody who passionately fights diversity in thought uh, in academia. Uh, you know, when you reached out to me, you thought I might bring a little bit of a different opinion to some things. Uh, you don't hear that often anymore in academia. I want to thank you for, for that and for your passionate support of trying to make sure that, uh, at least in your, in your sphere of influence, there is a diverse set of opinions on some really important things. And China is one of them. And so I'm hoping that you can lay it out. You're a great author. I don't know how many books you have now, over 10. Uh, uh, all of them good and enriching. Uh, Thucydides Trap is certainly making the rounds. Uh, and you know, you and I may differ a little bit on this uh, notion of how we deal with China. I think we have the same goal, but that's why I'm so fascinated to have you here today to talk this through. As a matter of fact, you'll appreciate this, Graham. I think we had uh, Nicholas Soames on the program actually earlier today. Uh, who also, I think, falls into your camp on how we treat China moving out and how we should do that. So I uh, am eager to hear some of your thoughts, and then we can have a dialogue. I'd be, I'd be uh, just happy to have that conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, Graham. So thank you very much, Mike, uh, and uh, thank the center for hosting this event. I'm happy to talk to Mike anytime. I learn a lot from him, and I agree that uh, we learn more from people that we disagree with or slightly disagree with than we do from the choir. So uh, uh, I'll try to be uh, brief and provocative, but I'm especially looking forward to the conversation because uh, uh, anybody that thinks that they have got a good fix on what's happening in the world today uh, simply haven't been looking. Uh, 
and are not serious. Uh, and anybody that thinks they understand entirely uh, or understand well even the China challenge, I think, uh, misses the mark. We're all stumbling around, as the, as the scripture says, looking through a glass darkly. Uh, and uh, I don't know anybody that actually uh, knows what to do. Uh, uh, so the fact that we're stumbling around here a little bit, I can start with just a historical uh, reference. Uh, so if you look at what happened in the U.S. after World War II, in fact, I wrote a piece about this in Foreign Affairs, uh, I think it was back in the first quarter on spheres of influence in which I pointed out that most of the people who had lived through World War II imagined that coming out of World War II, we were going to have one world. The U.S. and the Soviet Union were allies in defeating Hitler. So they were trying to create a one world with the UN and the Security Council and so forth. And it took them actually two years to finally figure out that the Soviet Union was the adversary and not going to be a part of one world, and another two years to figure out what to do. So the fact that we are now uh, uh, stumbling, uh, unless we're a lot smarter than the wise men, I think that's normal in the, in the conditions that we currently face. So let me uh, start with four questions briefly, and I'll give you in uh, respect to Washington today, a tweet size answer to each, then I'll say another word or two, but if I at any point uh, disagree or jump in for others, and okay, I have a, have a question for you too, if it's okay. So first question is what the hell is going on in the relationship between the US and China? I get calls every day from a congressman or senator or somebody in the administration that says, I still don't get it, I don't understand. What the hell is going on? Uh, secondly, what comes next? Uh, third, how much worse could it get? And fourth, what should sane uh, Americans and others be trying to do in these conditions? So for the tweet size, what's going on? Uh, on the surface, uh, the most vicious political fight we've seen in living memory between uh, a uh, Trump-led Republican campaign uh, that believes its vision of America, and indeed for Trump personally, is uh, his personal conditions are at stake in this election. And a Biden-led Democratic campaign that believed that what's at stake is America's democracy. So this is about as big a face-off as you could imagine. And this, Mike, I hope when we get to this, you'll talk more about it, but once you get into a political campaign, the, the uh, campaign rhetoric is not about facts or not about analysis. It's about claims that hit responsive chords with enough of an electorate for one's purposes. Uh, if we look back historically, things that people have said in campaigns often don't pass a very strict uh, test of the sort we would do if we were doing analysis. So this is, gonna, this is what's happening on the surface. And I was talking to some Chinese actually yesterday. And I said, if you think that what the campaigns are saying about China is bad, look and see what they're saying about each other. So Trump may call coronavirus the China virus, but what does Nancy Pelosi call coronavirus? She calls it the Trump virus. <laughs> so welcome, welcome to American electoral politics. Uh, that's on the surface. If that was all the problem, that would be uh, bad enough, but it would be okay. Underneath this, what's going on, is a classic Thucydidean rivalry. A classic case in which a meteoric rising China is threatening to displace a colossal ruling U.S. from positions and prerogatives we've become accustomed to, thinking are naturally ours. So what's going on? Two levels, a political food fight, extreme fight, indeed a vicious fight at the political level, 
in which China is basically become a target for both campaigns and each trying to demonstrate it's tougher than thou and the other is softer than it is. But underneath this, once the campaign is over, and if there hadn't been the campaign, and before the campaign, and next year, and a decade from now, we have a meteoric rising China threatening to displace a ruling US. And that'll be the principal dynamic of international relations for as far as we can see. Question two, what comes next? If you read the book I published in 2017, just as Trump came into office, it's called Destined for War, Can the U.S. and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? I forecast that the relationship would get worse before it got worse. So what comes next? It gets worse before it gets worse. Third, how much worse could it get? Uh, it's, it's very difficult for normal people to believe, uh, but in general, in the normal case, when you have a Thucydidean rivalry, it ends in war, not a tariff war, not a press war, not a tech war, war in which uh, combatants are firing bombs and bullets, killing each other and each other's fellow citizens. So how much worse could it get? A whole lot worse. Even a real bloody war. Even though everybody in China knows that would be crazy for China, everybody in the US knows that would be crazy for the US, but uh, as the line goes, you don't have to be interested in war for war to take an interest in you. And finally, what about sane people as best we can under these circumstances? I think we need to recognize that what we thought was the US-China relationship is now over, dead, buried. Move on. We're not going back to engagement and cooperation to grow together in a version of kumbaya globalism. That's not, not going to happen and not realistic. Was it realistic before? But what will a new strategic rationale for a relationship short of war be? Well, there's the question. So that's my four questions and four answers. I can give you a little more on each if you want, or we can pick up the conversation here, whichever you'd like to go. Thanks, Graham. I, uh, as always, I enjoy the, the how succinct you are in put, <laughs> laying out the case of, of maybe we all don't know where we're going. And I hope you do get a little bit on more of those. I, just, let's just talk, let's try to take them. I mean, what is going on? How would you grade the relationship today between the US and China? Um, was, it, was it time to engage China in at least trying to get them to behave somewhat uh, normally in, a, in, a, in international commerce? Uh, you know, I got onto this issue early on in my congressional career because I watched what they were doing with counterfeit auto parts from, you know, I represented the great state of Michigan and they were copying and then duplicating these parts by you know, intellectual property theft in the, in the aftermarket and third, you know, the third party markets around the world. And it was absolutely killing us. And at that time, I couldn't get anyone to pay attention. I mean, they thought I was a little bit crazy running around saying, hey, we got a China problem. They're stealing our intellectual property. Uh, and I think the tension, I think, the fact that they had no consequence allowed them to continue that. And then better cyber connectivity allowed them to even ramp it up even more. So I'm just curious, is, is, was this the time? Did we miss an opportunity? Have we bungled this uh, in trying to get a hold of that particular problem? Well, I, unfortunately, I would say yes. But we bungled it well before you began uh, helping you know, raise concern or raise attention. So the new conventional wisdom, and it's roughly right, says <clears throat> that at least the expectation that you, the American foreign policy establishment, Republican and Democrats, embraced after the end of the Cold War, in which, if you remember, this is 1991, 
the most popular thesis of the time in Washington and in the academy was Frank Fukuyama's End of History. So it literally, you can't say it or even read several of the lines without smiling. And you say, oh, I never believed that. No one ever believed. The answer is, excuse me. Yes, lots of people subscribe to the notion that with the American victory in the Cold War, according to Fukuyama, ideological battles were over. Democracy and market economies had won. And every country to succeed was going to follow the US model in building a market economy, which would make them wealthier, and that would lead them to democratize, and then they would be part of a one world, which it was somehow imagined they were going to be happy for the Americans to supervise. That part was a little bit unclear, but Tom Friedman, if you look at his best-selling book, The World is Flat, declares the McDonald's of Golden Arches theory of peace. According to this theory, two countries that have golden arches cannot go to war because citizens are standing in line waiting for hamburgers and don't want to fight. Now you look, you can't even, you can't, you, it's impossible to say this, but this was a governing uh, engagement strategy that started with the WTO and it said, okay, if China can become involved in the international institutions, then it'll grow economically. And as it grows economically, it'll democratize. And as it democratizes, it'll socialize to, it'll follow in the footsteps of Germany and Japan. Again, this was an illusion, an illusion that Republicans and Democrats together bought into. Uh, so uh, from the Chinese perspective, I think uh, they've been more successful than anyone could have imagined in growing their own economy to the point that it's now larger than the US in purchasing power parity to become the number one trading partner of everyone. And how have they done that? Well, in the good old fashioned way. Normally, uh, developing countries steal everything they can steal. The Americans were pretty effective uh, thieves of the British. Uh, actually, Pillsbury, I think. Is that in Michigan? Uh, yeah. So where did the, where did the, where did the pill? Uh, we do have a division, yes. And Kellogg's. Uh, Kellogg's and, is and, and, and where did, and where did their formulas come from? From Britain, and they stole them. Uh, so in the good old fashioned way. So basically, <clears throat> it's not surprising that developing countries steal what they can. The question is, how does a, uh, uh, economy like ours managed to contain that and control it and uh, limit it and to punish it. So I would say uh, they got away with a lot more than was expected. Now partly this was uh, they were so poor and so inconsequential that no one really, you know, it didn't really matter, it was said. And again for the economists they were arguing, well, all of these things like auto parts in the U.S. are uh, high labor content anyhow. So if it's not China, it'll be somebody else. So if you look actually at the practices of China and of India, if you talk to companies, when I talk to them, they say, you know, India is even more egregious than China. They're just not as successful. So, but as China has now grown to become big and in our face and taking actually displacing us. I mean, the whole idea to me, and for somebody from Michigan, the idea that the number one automaker in the world is not Detroit and Motown, excuse me, that we invented this, that's ours. To which the answer is, well, China produced 24 million cars last year and we produced, I don't know, 18 or 19. So part of the problem is they got four times as many people as we do. So if they're only one quarter as productive as we are, they'll end up with the GDP our size. So I think we fail to kind of appreciate what, you know, the, I think that the, their, the degree and, and speed of their success, and then to try to find a way to cope with it. The notion of uh, stealing intellectual property is a standard problem 
for companies all the time. I mean, in Silicon Valley, that's what companies do to each other. That's why they spend all their time suing each other. Uh, if you look at the suits between uh, Qualcomm and Apple, they became to be so many that the judge finally said, forget about it. I'm just going to make a judgment. <laughs> you know, Apple, you got to pay these guys for all this stuff you stole. So I think policing intellectual property is a challenge. It's a challenge in, in, in within an economy and between economies. And I think in dealing with China, we've done a poor job of policing, especially the things that matter you know, most to us. And thank you for that. Can I just draw one difference where I see it here is Please. intellectual property theft has been as, around as long as we've been a nation, including when we stole the, the, uh, the ability to use looms in manufacturing. We stole it from our very not so good friends at the time, Great Britain. But I would say what, what struck me as difference about this is that every element of national power is used to steal intellectual property, to purposely take back, to put to a company that will build a Chinese uh, company and artificially compete in the world. Because they had come to the conclusion that that was, uh, seems to me, easier, cheaper, faster. And it, it worked. And so imagine if the United States said, okay, we'll do the same thing. We're gonna steal every bit of design from Germany uh, on everything, which is what the Chinese do, on everything. And we're gonna bring it back and we're gonna hand it to American companies and say, there you go, go ahead and, and, you know, and beat the Germans. That to me just seems so much more different than individual companies engaging in, in, in industrial espionage, as we know has gone on forever. And that's the part that always got me a little bit worried. Uh, and I think it, uh, you know, that when you look at the disproportionate rise of companies that if you were in a competitive environment could never do this. And Huawei is the greatest example uh, of how a company had the benefit of all of the elements of government, diplomacy, economics, uh, military intelligence, civilian intelligence, their national security apparatus. And they used all of those things around the world to build this great company. Uh, and, and, and that's, isn't, isn't there a difference? And how can we, is, should we be treating it different or should we not? Sorry. So am I, they keep saying I'm unmuted. Am I good? We can hear you. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So the, I would say you put your finger on exactly a big point. The Chinese, for the Chinese, their national growth is their national project. When she says his dream is to, the China dream, to make China great again, the foundation of that is to make China rich again by growing its economy. And they do use all of the instruments of national power to that end. Uh, in our case, uh, while our intelligence community uh, may and obviously does monitor technological developments in other countries, as you know, as a former chairman of the committee better than I do, we have a problem that if we find a piece of intellectual property, we can't give it to one company rather than the other because we believe companies should compete with each other. So other than a few selective examples in the defense industries, we're not in the same business that, that they are. And so recognizing that China is different is one of the things we fail to do. And the extent to which they do coordinate effectively, more effectively than we would have imagined all of the instruments of national power to advance their interests. So that means we need to be smart enough to say, okay, confronting that, what do we do? How do we contain it? How do we constrain it? How do we limit it? How do we punish it? Uh, how can we reach agreements in particular areas? And I think uh, given that the underlying reality is that China does want to be as productive as we are. Well, now, wait a minute. If they were only half as productive as we are, with four times as many people, I don't like that. They would be twice our GDP. They could have twice our defense budget. They could have twice our intelligence efforts. Well, wait a minute, I, I, I have come from red, white, and blue North Carolina. 
I believe USA means number one. So this is a this is a predicament that we haven't faced before, and I don't think we can escape it by only pointing to the things they did. I think we have to ask ourselves, given that they're doing what they're doing, what can we do to, to, to protect our interests? What can we do to advance our interests? And I think that, uh, unfortunately, if we simply agree on some constraint, uh, that in itself is not self-enforcing. So there needs to be an agreement that's clear enough with enforcement, or sorry, with the, with the review process uh, that's uh, suspicious, and, uh, and then some capacity for punishing. And I think if I were to fault the WTO and the uh, negotiations at the time, largely because people never imagined you would see a China soaring, that they could have gotten them to agree to a level of uh, constraints and verification uh, that we don't, you know, that we fail to do. I, I cover this as, uh, as you do, as an old Cold Warrior. So in dealing with the Soviet Union, we never imagined they wouldn't do anything in their interest if they could get away with it. So when Reagan said, trust but verify, that was just using a, a, a old Russian slogan. What that really means is don't trust this bastard an inch. You know, nothing that you can, anything you can't verify, if it's in his interest, he's gonna do it. So when we reached arms control agreements, actually, as you'll remember, we couldn't even agree on the number of nuclear warheads because we didn't have any way to tell how many nuclear warheads are in some bunker sitting next door. So we agreed on constraints on launchers, which we could see visibly uh, with our own intelligence as a way of constraining, even though it was not as efficient. Uh, so I, I, think, I think there are lessons in that space that we should be applying in the efforts here, particularly in arenas where they impact important American interests. Okay, that's great, thank you. So Graham Allison is now head of foreign affairs for the United States of America. What's the first one, two, or three things you would do to change policy with China, specifically China? Whoa, okay. Uh, fortunately, this is not much risk of uh, being real, so let me think. And I have not thought carefully about this. It's a great question. So you should tell me your answer too. So I think first I would, I would have a long pause to look to see where we are, how we got here, what we did right, what we did wrong, but, but a very, uh, a very uh, clear assessment. Uh, and uh, um, I think that assessment would conclude with some version of the recognition that this is a classic Thucydidean rival. That as long as China continues making progress in realizing the China dream, every day we're gonna wake up and it's gonna be encroaching on prerogatives and positions that we think are naturally ours. So that's gonna be happening. And the way in which they do it will be every way they can get away with. So I would say that's just sort of baked into the structure of the situation. So secondly, I then look and say, uh, well, where is this happening that will have the biggest impact on our national interests? And I, when I teach this in my course, I go back to this Commission on American National Interests that I was part of, uh, that's got a hierarchy of national interests. So in a hierarchy of national interests, not everything matters as much as something that matters. So some things matter a lot more than other things. So I start with vital interests for the US, defined as our survival and well-being of Americans. And then I ask in that space, what's challenging those interests? And there I look at, for example, um, the competition in AI and the way that might 
have huge impacts for both intelligence and military that might provide capacity for China to coerce us. Well, that's a big one for me. Okay, so I'd go through an exercise like that. But then finally, I think, uh, and I've written about this, uh, I would work hard on a new strategic rationale, a new concept for what we're doing in our relationship with China. And one that would be good enough for us, not great, but good enough, and good enough for them. And the version that I've I mean, that's just the how to escape Thucydides trap question that I've been on the hunt to for now almost four years since I sent this Thucydides book to the publisher. I found nine possible avenues of escape, uh, one of which would be a version of Cold War II, which is the, seems to be the preferred option in much of Washington today. But actually, the one that I find most interesting is a combination of an insight John Kennedy came to after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that's on the one hand, and an ancient Chinese idea uh, that they uh, uh, adopted in their relationship with the Liao, a northern Mongol tribe, about a thousand years ago in the Song Dynasty. So briefly, uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which you'll remember, but most of your viewers probably think it was before the First World War or something. This is 1962, the most dangerous confrontation in history. John Kennedy thought there was a one in three chance it would end in nuclear war that would kill a couple of hundred million people. And in my study of this and other historians, that's not an exaggeration. So we had a one in three chance of really nuclear catastrophe. After that, Kennedy began to think about anything. Oh, wait a minute, we can't do this again, this kind of confrontation with the Soviet Union. So he gave a, uh, his best foreign policy speech, was the American University uh, commencement speech, five months before he was assassinated. He said, we're going to adapt our Cold War strategy. We're now going to have to, even though we're, I, I still believe the Soviet Union is an evil empire, and I still believe the free world is, is the right and the, and the right way to go, we're still going to have to build with them what he called a world safe for diversity. So a world safe for diversity, diverse enough for an evil system there and a good system here, which would compete peacefully over time to demonstrate which could better deliver what their citizens want. So that's one idea. Second idea, uh, about a thousand years ago, uh, 1005, the Song Dynasty uh, was dealing with the northern Mongol tribe, the Liao. They tried to defeat them, they couldn't. So they negotiated a treaty in which they agreed to be what historians call rival partners. Now, for most diplomats, that sounds like a contradiction. So, rival and partner, to which the answer is in certain areas, they would be fierce rivals. In other areas, they would be thick partners. And that treaty, the Chanyan Treaty, eventually broke down, but only after 120 years. So if you could take these two ideas and sort of mush them together, so a world safe for diversity, in which we try to demonstrate we make our democracy work successfully, and they try to demonstrate they make their autocracy, their party-led autocracy work, and we see how that works. I'm confident that inside of people's breasts is a heart beating to be free, so I'm betting on our team, but they can bet on their team. Let's see how that works out. And at the same time, define areas in which will be fierce rivals. So with respect to 5G or AI or, uh, or actually uh, trade, will be very fierce rifles, especially in particular areas. And in other areas, for example, not letting some third party drag us to a real war, or indeed finding a way to deal with the climate challenge, or indeed even dealing with coronavirus, we'll find ways to cooperate to some extent. So now, is that possible? I don't know. And could you articulate a, a concept of it that would be 
uh, viable in American politics, especially since a much easier uh, default is just to declare China is the enemy and let's organize against them uh, and try to organize the world against them. Uh, I wouldn't think that was necessarily a bad idea, except for the fact that you could see this in Mike Pompeo's speech last week, that he gets up to the edge of wanting to do that. And he and I've talked about this before. And then he notices, wait a minute, China is already so integrated into the global economy that isolating them from it or decoupling them from it is not going to work because other countries are not going to go along with this. So I think we're going to have to find a way. I mean, I think it was Scott Fitzgerald that had a good line about uh, the test of a first class mind is to be able to hold two contradictory ideas in the head simultaneously and still function. So whether a government could do that, I don't know. Sorry, that's a long answer, but it's a complicated question. How about you? If you were if you were given this assignment, what would you do? Well, I think the first thing I would do is organize the government to in the promotion of trade with the free market model. So there are certain things that we used to do. We don't do very well about promoting U.S. companies and being competitive overseas, number one. So those institutions that we have, uh, I would make sure are functioning at that level. Second, I would be just a rampant trade. So I'd sign as many trade deals as we could print off the printer as fast as we can with our Asian friends uh, and the rest of the world. I mean, I, I hopefully we can get this deal with Great Britain wor worked out. Uh, I would be very, very aggressive because I think one of the ways you're going to push back on them, uh, and to, really to your point, you, you know, let, the, let that wick burn for totalitarianism because uh, it rubs people the wrong way. Uh, and in the meantime, we're in your neighboring country uh, engaged in commerce at a very high level. And so when we pulled out of that Asia trade pact uh, uh, trade agreement, I thought it was a serious mistake unless you were going to have within the next three months individual trade deals with all those countries okay i could have lived with that we don't have any of that and we're you know almost four years on and have no capability to outrun the chinese even in their backyard and put so much pressure on our allies uh, because of the economic clout that they have uh, and we're in a weird time in our history where sometimes your economic interests diverge from your national security interests and we see that in Australia and other places. My argument is we shouldn't contribute to that. We ought to make that as, uh, we ought to close that gap as much as we can. And I think you do that through trade. So I, those are the two things that I would do out of the chute. Uh, I know uh, a lot of these organizations have been attacked about uh, giving, you know, uh, corporate welfare for these companies to go over and compete out of seas, but overseas. But if we don't come up with some creative loan programs, by the way, that they have to pay back, that would be the difference from the Chinese system, uh, and promote those, those companies overseas and allow us to compete against zero money down, uh, full payment of, a, of the 5G build out network, including engineers for three years, don't make a dollar's payment. No, no company in the world can compete with that, but that's what the Chinese are doing. So I think we just have to be creative from a free market perspective, engage in trade, and I would push back on, I'd continue to let them know that we're not going to tolerate wholesale government uh, theft of intellectual property for the purposes of growing a Chinese state. Won't do it. Um, and so we will be aggressive about pushing back on that. And then again, we could have a whole another discussion on how, what, how our military uh, and protection of, of trade routes would play into that. I'd be aggressive about at least demonstrating the U.S. Navy is not going to give up freedom of navigation. We will not do it. I mean, you know, the Navy was really built uh, to support trade. <laughs> and my argument is we ought to use it to support trade. So I think those are the simple things that I would do uh, up front to see if we couldn't right this ship. And I, and I agree with you, dialogue is important. Uh, we, we have to continue to talk with them. Uh, and I would con continue to demand better behavior from them. You know, I, I don't really mind trade with China or China trade with the United States, but I do want it fair. And I want you to respect intellectual property and then let's have at it. I think we can, I think we can win that. And I think we can have trade that's mutually beneficial to both countries, but can't get there if the other side's cheating. 
I think that's a good uh, that's a good summary. I think the um, trying to realize that in some arenas we have shared interests uh, that are vital for both of us. So if some sequence of events drags us into a war because Kim Jong Un does something and we respond and they respond and we end up as we did in 1950 with the war between the US and China, this would be a catastrophe for all the dreams of Chinese and all the dreams of Americans. So that's the thing that for me is the specter. Uh, there we have a shared interest. That requires thick conversations and some understandings about what's likely to happen, what are the risks, how to manage crises, how to actually prevent crises. So that's a big area for cooperation. I think secondly, uh, if I look at the climate space, I know uh, President Trump doesn't like this, but I think most reasonable people see we can't, either country cannot continue using green, emitting greenhouse gases the way we have historically. So we have to find a way to adjust. And that requires adjustment by both of us because we're the two biggest emitters. So if one of us were to go to zero and the other, forget it you only delay by a few years, whatever would be the bad consequences. So that's something we gotta find a way to cooperate in dealing with. I think in trade space, as you say, in general, trade is a good thing because as Adam Smith taught us, if you have uh, trade on the basis of comparative advantage, we get a bigger pie. Now we can wrestle a little bit about whether you get this piece or I get that piece, but in any case, there's more for everybody to go around. That makes sense. The hard part of this for me though, that I'm completely still you know, wrestling with is, so all of that happens. And now China is half as productive as the US. So they're playing completely by the rules, but they still are half as productive as we are. So it's 2024. And now they have a GDP twice ours. But we've been accustomed to having the biggest GDP to have things our way. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've written in a separate context. I, I think I stole the line from my old professor, Henry Kissinger, that basically the core American strategy has been to overwhelm problems with resources. So we may not be too swift about finding a good strategy, but we just keep pouring effort into it until we succeed. But if we were dealing with a competitor that was bigger than we were, and it's very adaptive using technology and adapting to technology and advancing technology. So some part of their tech world is the result of theft and replication. But if I look at their uh, AI activity, uh, the piece that Eric Schmidt and I wrote in the National Interest in January, we took six arenas. They're a full scale competitor now and in many areas like well ahead of us. So in FinTech, Basically, when Apple is doing Apple Pay, they're just copying WePay. So they're, they're basically following a, a Chinese leader. So I think, I think the implication of that, when I do it strategically, is if you think about a seesaw of power, so with each of us on one end or the other, and they get, keep getting bigger and heavier, so our feet keep getting lifted off the ground, then we have a premium on having some allies of like-minded, aligned, on our side of the seesaw. And that was, I agree with you completely, what was possible or what could have been possible in an appropriate Asian trade agreement. We would have had 40% of the world's GDP on one side against 15% on the other. Well, you can make a, better, a much better deal when you're looking uh, uh, at somebody with their feet off the ground 40 versus 15 than when you're, you know, even or slightly uneven. Which uh, goes to show you that everything we needed to know about foreign affairs, we learned on the playground. Thanks. We did. We did. Uh, there's a big lesson there. <laughs> it is a big lesson there. I appreciate that. And I don't want to uh, uh, abuse our all of our uh, attendees and, and viewers. I'd like them to get a chance to get some questions in here. Uh, so I am going to ask the talented Erica to come back 
uh, and if she will, and uh, kind of field some questions and keep this moving along um, and give them an opportunity to ask. There's some, I see some great questions in the queue. I think you'll enjoy them. Yes, thank you both for that illuminating discussion. We do have a few uh, questions already in the queue, but as a reminder, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask your question. You can also raise your hand as a way to ask a question as well. So let me start off with the first question from Michael Kuttner. He asked, how much of the conflict and rivalry between the US and China is based on irreconcilable beliefs about freedom, democracy, and government, as opposed to power and position? Be in a bad position if China had similar political values to us, but was just as assertive in dealing with other countries. Great question. So, uh, uh, if you read uh, Secretary Pompeo's speech that I referred to, he tries to make the fundamental problem uh, the Communist Party's autocracy and its uh, demand for, um, for its citizens to basically comply as opposed to uh, exercising political freedoms that we think are their natural rights. And there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, and I write about it again in my, my Destined for War book, I picked up my former colleague, uh, Sam Huntington's uh, uh, Clash of Civilizations proposition, that uh, there's a civilizational component of this, there's an ideological component of this. We as Americans take as the central political value the liberty of individuals. And we think the rest of the structure is for maximizing that. The Chinese system, both culturally and civilizationally, and then also uh, in an extreme version in the current party-led no, party society, takes order as the primary political value. And hierarchy, in which people know their place, as the appropriate way to have a harmonious order. So that's a serious conflict, I believe. But on the other hand, uh, Thucydides was not about ideology. It was about power. And I think if China were essentially uh, to have uh, a, a democracy like, let's say, Japan, uh, but nonetheless to have its national interests, we would find a China that's bigger and stronger, encroaching on our positions and prerogatives, and would find ourselves in a standard Thucydidean dynamic. And if you look at my book, the last 500 years, there's 16 cases this has occurred. Uh, 12 of them ended in war. Some of these were among parties who had contrary ideologies. Some, for example, in the case of Great Britain and Germany, uh, the, the king and the Kaiser were cousins. So places that were politically and culturally very aligned. So I think the primary driver in this is not the values or ideology, but instead uh, power and interest as the questioner said. Okay, so our next question, speaking of your book, follows up on that. Um, Wolfgang asked, Dr. Allison, I read your book with great benefit and I appreciate your examples in history. However, don't nuclear weapons as the new element make a huge difference? Yes, uh, nuclear weapons make a big difference. Uh, uh, they have what, what you as a security student uh, understand, it's called a crystal ball effect. So I can see that if I end up in a war and it becomes a nuclear war, that my own country is destroyed. And it's not hard to conclude that's a bad idea. Uh, so the dawning of mutual assured destruction created a degree of stability in the relationship between the US and the Soviet Union and the Cold War. All that being said, the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred under these conditions. And I do believe that there was at least a one in three chance that that would have ended in a nuclear war. So I don't think we can take for granted that even though there's an element of stability, 
that creates a degree of caution, and that's a good thing, and we should keep looking at it so we don't forget. Because when people say, well, okay, if it comes to that, there'll just be a conflict, even a fighting between the US and China. I keep saying to them, yes, that's possible at some stage, but remind yourself that if that were to escalate into a nuclear war, it would mean the elimination of all the things you value. So there's hardly any value for which that's the right choice. Ronald Reagan got it exactly right uh, when he said, a nuclear war cannot be won. It must therefore never be fought. So that's a, a big lesson, but we shouldn't take for granted that one couldn't have an event in Taiwan to which China responded and we responded and we got dragged into a war as we did, for example, in 1950 in Korea. And that war could escalate to a nuclear war and the end of that could be we all go to hell. On that note, um, so let's take the next question from Philip Ha. Dr. Allison, is it possible to move towards either of your two ideal strategies while Xi Jinping is still in power? Well, hardline CCP members of the old guard and new leaders on both sides are becoming more hardline and distrustful on the other side. So a very good question. <coughs> Xi Jinping is a remarkable leader. Uh, indeed, I've written about him separately as the new emperor of China. I think he's the most ambitious, actually the most competent, and likely to be the most consequential leader on the international stage today. That's a big statement. He's undertaken four simultaneous revolutions currently in China. I describe them in a, in a chapter of my book called What She's China Wants. In one line, he wants to make China great again. And he's absolutely determined. He's laid out specific objectives for China in 2025, 2030, 2049, when it'll celebrate the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the, of the Chinese Communist State. And I think he imagines he's going to hang around for much of that, at least until 2035. So he's got a vision and he's got a plan and he has a government and he's driving to that end. So dealing with them will be extremely difficult, extremely difficult, but he's the leader we have of the country that we have to deal with and we have to deal with. So I think, is it possible to imagine uh, establishing a new strategic rationale in effect in which we would be rivalry partners in a world safe for diversity where He's trying to demonstrate that his party-led autocracy can succeed. He's doing a pretty good job at this stage. And we will try to demonstrate that our democracy can work better than his. And we'll see how this works out. I'm still sufficiently confident in the core values of the American uh, experiment that I'm prepared to run that competition. So in order to make sure that we finish up on time, I'm going to combine these last two questions. So from Hugo Jones, we have a question on human rights. Would human rights play a key part in the escalation of tension toward the conflict between China and the USA, or are these issues unimportant compared to trade and defense? And then from Gary Donato, in this still anarchic system, would you argue that the individual level of analysis, rational actor model, remains to preclude a great power conflict degenerating into a nuclear conflagration? Two great questions. They deserve a long answer, but given the time, let me just be brief. On the second question, I think that would take a long time to work on and to think through but I think you're absolutely right to distinguish between trying to do this analysis between two rational actors where uh, understanding the catastrophic consequences of nuclear war 
they would in their own interest uh, of prevent and avoid and manage any crisis that could lead to that outcome on the one hand and doing that same analysis from a model two or model three perspective in which you discover and see how factors that you would otherwise overlook in a rational actor model analysis could end up being important. So I think that's a great question and I think that uh, implied answer is correct. On the, on the first question, uh, for Americans, human rights obviously matter. We have a Declaration of Independence that says that human beings in their birthright are endowed from their creator with unalienable rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It doesn't say Americans. It says everybody, Chinese, Tibetans, Uyghurs, <laughs> among others. So yes, of course, we care about the human rights of Chinese in Hong Kong. How about in Beijing? And how about in Xinjiang? Of course. But the question is, where does this stand in the hierarchy of our interests? I think we should be forthright in standing up for our interests and values. We should be forthright in spotlighting China's abuses of people's freedoms. We should, so we should make no apologies for any of this, but I think that our ability to impact their behavior with respect to human rights, as we found again in other countries, is quite limited. And so I think we have to be realistic about the fact that in spite of the fact that they're engaged in abusing other people's rights, we may still, and we will still, have to try to deal with them because of other interests that we have. Well, thank you for that. And thank you everyone for your questions. And let me turn it over to Chairman Rogers for final remarks. Uh, thank you, Erica. Thank you, uh, uh, Graham. I, I have to tell you, I, I guess as always, and I hope the viewers had a chance to know why I always walk away smarter than when I showed up in your company. So thank you for that. Uh, really interesting take on this. And, and I think you've laid out the challenges better than anybody on going forward in China. And even the period that we're, we're in, uh, we may have to be tough for a little while, but at the end of the day, we're gonna have to look toward a forward and future leaning relationship with China and everything that they are going to be in the world and what our place is gonna be like it. So thank you very much for that. For everybody, I hope you read uh, Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides Trap? Uh, 2017, it's a national and international bestseller. Uh, holy mackerel, I'm not sure I ever met an international bestseller for, from, from you, Graham. So thanks for your work on that. Um, I'll, I'll ask Glenn if he has any final comments. But again, thank you for your time. Thanks for uh, all that you do here. And again, more, the most important thing you do is offer that diversity of thought, and you take diversity of thought, which is very rare in the country today. So I I, I, I Given that I live at Harvard, I need diversity of thought. <laughs> well, I won't say a word. <laughs> I'll let everybody interpret. I can say that twice, yes. Exactly. Maybe even, even three times. Even, even three times. So. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to future conversations. Let's stay engaged uh, and, uh, and, and we'll continue to have this, uh, I think, great discussion, an important discussion for America's future. Anytime. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Good question. Graham. Thanks, Graham. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Mike. Be well.